Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Education, SOE, Master's Degree Programs, Master of Arts, Distance Education, MADE, Second Year. MD 419 Staff Training and Development in Distance Education. Block 3 Implementational Aspects. Unit 1 Training Needs Assessment. 1.0 Introduction. All of us would acknowledge the importance of studying a given problem before finding solutions to it. We applaud the value of analysis prior to action in a situation that warrants action, irrespective of the sphere of operation, be it an educational institution, a cooperation, a government, office, or a social service agency, in the context of training, that initial. Pursuit of information about the situation is often called needs assessment. But what is needs assessment? How should a trainer think about needs? Assessment in order to plan and execute a useful one? Why should we do these assessments? What are the questions asked? What are the sources? Contacted? What tools, methods should we use? These are some of the Questions that we need to address ourselves to before we actually conduct a training program. In this unit, we shall discuss some of these issues and aim to relate them to the context of distance education. 1.1 Objectives After reading through this unit, you should be able to times explain the reasons for conducting training needs assessment, TNA, in general. Times comment on the various methods used for TNA and their advantages. Disadvantages and Times carry out a training needs assessment when required in your organization or your own functional areas. One point to reasons for needs assessment. There are a few purposes of training needs assessment, TNA. When we Conduct needs assessments, we are seeking detailed information about factors which are responsible for the success or failure of an organization in achieving its goals and objectives. We shall consider some of them here. Times optimal performance, it involves asking such questions as what is it that the exemplary performer knows and does that exemplifies success? How should a course writer use a computer? For example, what is it that a counsellor must know about assignment evaluation? What is involved in producing self-instructional print, audio-video packages? Similar questions must be asked about the performance of all other functionaries. In the system of distance education, time's actual performance, it entails asking varying questions such as what? Does a course writer do that makes the learning materials self-instructional? What do the counsellors already know about assignment evaluation? Why does the management think there is a need for training? What are the employees doing or failing to do? For this purpose, we usually would seek the help of records of employee. Performance, insider-outsider observations, employee self-appraisal reports etc. and compare their actual performance with the optimal performance aimed at in every functional area. Times feelings As trainers we would want to know how trainees feel about the topic for training, the significance attached to the topic, and the level of confidence the trainers have in handling the topic, their human attributes as trainers and the overall impact the training programs have on the trainees. Of course, this is an evaluation exercise, but it would inform us to redesign our training to meet the training needs more effectively in future. TNA further helps us identify the causes of performance problems on the part of the trainers. One can attribute various reasons for performance problems. We can categorize them as under I. Lack of skill or knowledge, 
even if one wanted to perform better, one just couldn't do it. For example, if one lacks the knowledge essential to writing behavioral statements on performance appraisals or retrieving data from the computer but attempts to impart training in those very areas, the outcome is easily predictable. 2. The environment. It is possible that trainees may not have the tools, forms or workspace necessary to perform a task. The classic example is the computer that keeps going down or the purchase of a new but inferior video editing board. In this situation, even the ablest trainer cannot perform well. 3. Few or improper incentives. What are the consequences of doing the job? Badly or not doing it at all? Perhaps the production of quality materials has been ignored in the past or the failure to respond to student needs likewise has been ignored. Do hard workers get loaded down with additional work assignments? Questions of these kinds would tell us about the training policy of an institution. If the institutional policies do not spell out the rewards and punishments related to performance. However much you try to train the staff in any area, the attitude of the staff towards their work will be one of indifference. 4. The unmotivated employee. Traditionally, we think employees are motivated on the external circumstances and by an inspiring environment. If the emotional and attitudinal domain of the employees are not positively disposed towards the tasks they are asked to perform. Then the motivation of the employee slides down and eventually disappears. If the motivation of performers is to be sustained, they must first be convinced of the purposefulness of their action. For example, you are training tutors or counselors through teleconferencing, which involves a lot of preparation at an enormous cost. During the performance you discover that there is no audience at the receiving end. This is sufficient to demotivate you completely and convince you of the futility of the act. Not even a master trainer can sustain his her motivation in this situation. Obviously, we have not listed all the factors here. The attempt is to put together a few factors under categories mentioned above. It is quite possible that one can come out with other equally important categories factors. 1.3 Identification Process A systematic analysis identification of training needs involves three processes. A. Organizational Institutional Analysis B. Role Job Analysis and C. Individual Analysis Let us discuss these processes of training needs. Analysis for our purposes. Organizational institutional analysis. Organizational analysis is a process of studying, collecting information and analyzing the state of affairs of an organization institution, its functioning in the light of its mission statements, performance of different categories of personnel ranging from top management to bottom level employees and Recording performance problems associated with each job category. Evidently, this effort involves huge investments in terms of cost and time. Precisely because of this reason, we should be very cautious in undertaking this process of needs analysis at the organizational level. However, we should remember that any comprehensive analysis involves analyzing the Institution organization in its entirety. Usually, this takes place when the institution concern desires to prepare a comprehensive training policy for the entire institution. It is, however, customary to identify certain problem areas or individual units within the institution for training needs analysis. This mainly depends on the mindset of parts making the whole. It is possible that it does work sometimes. But, identifying needs or particular 
Units or personnel in isolation may result in the problem of incompatibility. A. Tension between the parts identified and the institutional objectives. Mandates as a whole. So, we should keep in view the following aspects. While doing organizational analysis. I. The effectiveness scope of this level of analysis depends greatly on the degree of support it receives from the organizational institution. 2. Different types of training reviews require different authority, status, and technical competence. 3. A high order objectivity, analytical evaluation, and interpersonal skills are necessary. Before designing a training program, it is essential on the part of a trainer, commissioned or in-house, to develop an awareness and understanding about the institution's mandates objectives, policies, functions, state of affairs, of its operations, work systems and processes, etc. This helps the trainer times identify the intended objectives and the actual functioning of the institution. Times identify the reasons for the gap. Times focus on those issues problems which need training interventions. An understanding about the working of an organization institution helps a trainer appreciate its strengths, opportunities, weaknesses and threats. Further the trainer can come to grips with its development plans, investment programs, technological progress, products or services planned workforce status and prospects, etc. The knowledge of the present and the future scenarios serve as a base to identify the different types of training. Needs and enables the trainer to suggest to the management a comprehensive training plan to meet the immediate and the future requirements. Organizational analysis, thus, is basically a process of studying and collecting. Information on the various aspects related to an institution's functioning with a view to finding out its training and development needs. Normally, we can conduct this analysis using the methods of observation, discussion, and interview or by referring to documented information. We shall talk about these methods at a later stage in this unit. The systematic conduct of Organizational analysis is essential because the analysis should provide objective and professional advice on human resources development. This should in turn provide the basis for the top management to decide the nature and extent of the role of training in achieving the organizational objectives. We have given below a few guidelines to such analysis. I. Detailing the objective, scope, terms of reference, and duration of the analysis. 2. Obtaining the authority to access relevant information from files and documents on various personnel. 3. Soliciting the cooperation of colleagues' employees at different levels and clarifying the purpose of the analysis and in the process dispelling their Suspicions, if any, for giving advance intimation regarding the time of visits, etc. We, collecting information regarding institutional objectives, policies, and functions, mandated and actual. 6. Identifying external environments that affect the functioning of the institution, including sociodemographic features, economic profile, government policies, market forces, competitive conditions, infrastructural facilities, etc. 7. Assembling all the information collected, correlating one information with the other and interpreting it to find performance problems at different levels. 8. Cross-checking the information data collected, if inconsistencies, discrepancies are deducted. 9. Finalizing the analysis report indicating various training requirements in order of priority. What is important in this process is to harmonize the training needs as perceived or felt by individuals with those of the institution. A judicious synthesis between the two is immensely beneficial of both the institutional 
growth and individual's career. We shall elaborate on this. As institutional training needs analysis would reveal various job positions requiring training intervention, we can select these job-related tasks and carry out a training need analysis oriented to these specific tasks. Once we conduct this, we will more often than not come across the level of performance of individuals and institution in our context a distance. Teaching agency employs various personnel to perform different tasks based on their competence level in terms of knowledge, skills and attitude. But, owing to reasons which cannot be captured in a list ranging from social to personal, an individual's competence may not fulfill the level of competence required to perform a task, you can easily think of a content. Expert employed as professor, associate professor, assistant professor and the level of competence required for translating their content expertise in terms of distance teaching materials in the open learning system. Clearly, the persons need training, but not any type of training would do. The kind of training to be imparted should suit the needs of each and for this purpose we should go for an analysis of individuals' needs. You may notice that we have given you the idea of general to specific organizational tasks and then individual type of training need analysis. Some would like to start from individual analysis and reach organizational analysis specific to general. Either way is possible and one cannot categorically say which one is better. The question of effectiveness depends on the context in which we operate. But what we should not forget is that we need to analyze training needs at all the different levels of the organization, job and person, assimilate them by finding out their interrelationships so as to help both the organization and the individuals in their development and growth. Job analysis is an interact method of identifying training needs, a new or an existing job is analyzed to produce a job description, which is then evaluated. The gap between the job description and the knowledge and skills of the current incumbent or the new employees becomes clear which helps design individual training programs. As is obvious, this method identifies the needs of the individual and the specific job rather than institutional needs. Further, the job description we arrive at may quickly be out of date. At this stage, it is useful to think of the need in terms of output rather than input. Usually, as mentioned earlier, we express a need as a gap, weakness or lack of something. For example, a course writer needs to know about the preparation of self-assessment questions or needs to appreciate the operation of other functional units in the institution. To turn the need into an objective, we need to think of the end result, i.e. the output. The date entry. Operator, for example, can operate the computer with no more than 5%. Wastage, perhaps we can't allow even this percentage of wastage, however, insignificant it may sound. Or the telephone operator can answer the Telephone calls within three rings and put it through to the correct person, too. A performance level of 99% accuracy. In essence, the training objectives should be specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, and time-bound. Training objectives thus should address the following. Times improving knowledge level. Times changing behavior and our attitudes. Time specifying time frames, what the participants will do during the training program at the end of the program and at their workplaces. 1.4 Methods of Conducting Needs Assessment In training contexts, we decide what the trainees ought to know, we teach. Train them how to perform a particular task. They take the cues and use them. 
still there are problems. Do you know why? The reasons for offering a training program vary. Sometimes it is political, sometimes a personal priority and sometimes a case of a real and pressing need. However, often, training occurs because it always has occurred earlier or because it is mandated by the authority. There might be specific performance problems. Then again, there might not be. Similarly, there might be new content or might not be. Once we have successfully identified optimal actuals and feelings, it is of paramount necessity on our part to determine the source of information that we need. Other questions should include Times where is the source of information located? Times what are the constraints on getting the data? Times who needs to know that you are involved with this innovation problem? Or priority setting? Remember that pre-training activity has the potential for extending the training function into every aspect of the institution. Times what is the impression that this effort will make? Times how do we reconcile competing interests and priorities? Times how do we market our department and conduct needs assessment? Simultaneously, the other important step in needs analysis is to select appropriate tools to suit the kind of information sought for. Different purposes and sources require different tools methods. The factor that separates effective from ineffective tool use is planning. Do we know why we are contacting the source? Is our purpose clear? Have we established an agenda or an interview schedule to structure our time? Let us now discuss a few methods. But first we shall work out the exercise given. 1.4.1 Development Centers Development centers in some countries function as service agencies to carry out needs assessment on request from a client, i.e. an organization. Institution They use a variety of assessment techniques to ensure the widest possible coverage of skills and attributes. The method used usually is multidimensional in that the technique includes individual group, oral, written and psychometric tests, as well as personality and career interest. Question is, development centers establish training and development needs for the individuals and the institution based upon clearly defined criteria that transcend the performance of the individuals in their current positions. Further, a development center designs assessments against clearly Identified criteria for specific groups within the institution so as to effectively meet the requirements of an institution. Establishment of development centers within the organization is an expensive affair and may sound too complex for a small organization. In distance education, institutions, the centers for staff development and research are usually Assign the above responsibility. 1.4.2 to Human Resources Audit This is simply to look at the number of employees within the institution and their location within its structure, detailing their age and the number of years in their current post. Once the details are collected, we are to make comparison between the number of employees required for the future usually for the next one to five years. The analysis will identify the number of vacancies arising through retirement and natural wastage, potential, promotion opportunities, etc. Used in conjunction with future plans, this exercise will help us identify where there will be serious shortages of resources, potential problems, etc., leading to chalking out plans for training and development which will meet future needs. This is an oft-practiced strategy. The process is fairly simple and cost-effective because the sought-after information is easily accessible. However, 
it is mostly resented in academia because plans are often seen as orders. This can easily be overcome if the top management interacts with the resenting groups and impresses on the need for it. 1.4.3 Interview Interview is the most commonly used method for needs assessment. This method requires, first of all, identifying the persons to be interviewed to ascertain their training needs. Usually the interview method is used with senior officials or employees who have unique roles within the institution and who have also specific training and development needs unique to them. However, interviews with a cross-section of the employees are essential to get a clear picture of the situation and the training needs. There are two types of interviews, structured and unstructured or open-ended. A structured interview uses a number of prepared questions as opposed to the unstructured one, where the direction of the discussion is not controlled rigidly. Through interviews, we can easily identify both real and perceived needs. This technique has drawbacks as well. For example, in an unstructured interview, the outcome will depend upon the direction of the discussion, which may leave out areas of critical importance. Contrastingly, in a structured interview, the outcome will depend upon the questions asked of the individual, and some areas again may be missed. More importantly, the interview provides a subjective view of the individual in areas discussed, which he she may consider difficult, and it requires the skill of the interviewer in probing those areas and eliciting relevant information. One may conduct an interview scheduled either face-to-face -face or at a distance. Say, for example, on the telephone. But it strictly depends on the purpose. Within the needs assessment process, Consider the table 1.1 just to get an idea about the purpose. Table 1.1 Purposes of interview and the corresponding media. Activities and media. 1. To inform someone about the project telephone. 2. To gather in depth information face to face. 3. To discuss difficult, complex, or controversial subject matter face to face. 4. To check out a point of two telephone. 5. To enlist support from a colleague face-to-face. -face. 6. To look at content that must be illustrated face-to-face. -face. 7. To save money telephone. 8. To form a working relationship face-to-face. -face. 9. To periodically nature a working relationship telephone. 10. To get an initial take on something telephone. 11. To get information from many people telephone. 12. To get information from a few key individuals face-to-face. -to, -face. to reiterate, the mode of interviewing largely depends on the purpose for which it is conducted. 1.4.4 Observation We can use observation schedules to look at any job. It involves a trained Observer observing an individual on job for a day or more over a period of time. Observers can either monitor the person for short, two or three hour periods and then make notes or have a structured checklist in which they will make notes against agreed criteria. This method can identify areas other than training needs, for example, inefficient working ways. This method requires an observer who is trained in the method. Observation techniques Help the observer see an individual operating in his her context and in a number of different work situations. If he she is an academic manager, the observer will see how he she behaves in course brief meetings, in dealing with counsellors, course writers, students, etc. and in deciding work. Priorities the drawback of this technique, however, is that anyone observing another person is bound to influence the way they react. Therefore, the observation has to be done over a period of time. Further, it is time-consuming and can be seen as disruptive by the individual being 
observed. Observation schedule. It is a highly acclaimed front-end tool. But, some have reservations about this. Tool as well, for which the main reason is the belief that observers alter. Employee performance. Thus, observation is a less effective tool for gathering information about actuals unless we are working incognito. But, then, it may be professionally unethical. Observation is, however, a very effective tool for seeking optimal performance. If employees know that you are observing, then their efforts will more closely approximate optimal performance. Observation schedules, more often than not, focus on behavioral processes and not on cognitive ones. After decades of a Behavioral orientation to education and training professionals seem to be now interested more in what an employee thinks about and knows that the work is being done. Very many times, interviews, not observations, get at the kind of information. However, observation provides information about what is really happening at work at two levels. The first level of observation seeks a broad gestalt. At this level, we get answers to questions of the following. Type. Times what goes on. Times what are the major components of the job. Times what are the most frequently recurring challenges. Times in what order do things usually happen. Times what kind of information is shared. Times what kinds of references or tools are relied upon. At the second level of observation, the trainer seeks such details as Times what separates effective performance from ineffective performance Times what kinds of response attract clients Times which ways work best Times how are work areas arranged Times is there anything that coordinators of learning, study, centers are doing That appears to be influencing the quality of performance etc. However, the above questions may be relevant where the performance is physical or related to psychomotor skills. To get the information about the process of developing a self-instructional unit in print, for example, we have to change techniques appropriately. 1.4.5 Performance Review Appraisal this method focuses on the outcomes of employee performance. Training professionals seek printouts, records, etc. to capture the details of what clients are doing from the results of their actions. We can examine records to generate the details of performance. We shall elaborate this point. If an institution conducts performance reviews or an appraisal scheme, it compares the appraisal with the job specification to find out what is missing. In other words, the institution tries to identify the gap between what should be done or what could be improved in job performance. Alternatively, the performance review appraisal scheme may do this by comparing job performance against specific performance criteria objectives and may include a section on training needs. The performance review appraisal is detailed because it looks at the needs of each individual. The analysis of the appraisal can provide useful inputs to the accuracy of information within the job description and the appraisal system. That is, the method can be limited. If the future plans of the institution are not communicated to all employees, for example, a departmental head may wish to expand and develop his her department based on the past record of performance but may not be aware that the top management plans to reorganize and the department is to be merged with another. 1.4.6 Questionnaire Survey A survey is usually an anonymous device for soliciting opinions from a large number of respondents. If you want the opinions of many, and of statistical significance, surveys are an excellent tool. Surveys, because of the potential 
for anonymity are particular effective for gathering the information required one can prepare produce questionnaires for part or whole of the institution sometimes however questions get misinterpreted and fail to elicit the information required questionnaires are generally used to identify institutional or departmental needs rather than individual needs for administering questionnaires institutions may use assistance form inside the organization or outside or both in the formulation of questions rating process coordination and analysis of the results etc the use of questionnaires helps cover a large number of individuals however as in any research context the number of responses can be very low a response of 50% is workable and time and effort have to be invested in ensuring that individuals realize the importance of the questionnaire for example the respondent should be convinced of on the fact that the outcome of the responses shapes the training and development of the institution the two basic question types are structured items and open ended items structured choice items are far better than our open questions a forced choice item will say which one of the following or rank this list or rate these according to in this case we provide respondents with a fixed set of options to which they respond in a predetermined fashion 1.4.7 review of plans a review of the institution's plans for the future gives valuable and necessary information in identifying the training and development needs it is this information that will enable the priority in training and development to be established to meet future as well as current needs the only reservation against the technique is that it cannot point to individuals needs and that it cannot identify specific problem areas 1.4.8 desk research desk research is a review and analysis of external factors as well as internal for example assessing the level of new employees in the institution will help design training programs to meet their needs it helps us identify the availability of formal courses and obtain relevant information about them through desk research we can review of the current training and development programs and ascertain whether or not they are still relevant to meeting the current and future needs this can incorporate the techniques of human resources audit and the review of plans it helps an institution keep up to date with outside influences and developments though cost effective and simple to do like the review of plans it is inadequate for identifying individual needs and so is limited in its application in other words desk research cannot be used as a sole method for identifying training needs because it is a process isolated from the people whose commitment and involvement is needed for the training to be successful 1.4.9 group discussion a number of individuals within an institution may sit together to discuss specific issues the individuals may be a team within a department or a number of officers at the same level the purpose of the discussion needs to be clearly defined i.e. to identify areas of concern or difficulty and areas of strengths and possible actions needed to resolve these areas of concern and build on strengths etc the group may meet several times with the assistance of a facilitator to guide and direct it the facilitator may be member of the group who has received specific facilitation training for this purpose group discussion ensure commitment from the participants and builds team work and recognition of other strengths and weakness as well as one's own it identifies need that if met can have an immediate impact on the success of the institution 
Further, a group discussion helps identify needs of individuals and group training and development needs. It places a heavy premium on the skill of the facilitator to form, guide and stop the group once the tasks have been accomplished. It is also possible, however, that the groups may talk but not resolve issues without some form of feedback from senior officers. Sometimes, it is quite likely that the public nature of the forum may stifle honest discussion. The suitability of the methods described here for our purposes will depend upon a number of factors such as the culture and size of the organization, the human resources available, the expertise they can bring to the implementation of such methods, the level of training needs you wish to identify, i.e., is it an organizational need or for a department or individual, the amount of time and money available, etc. We, however, recommended the use of a combination of the above methods. We can undertake the identification of training needs at several different levels within an institution. We may undertake needs identification at corporate, departmental, team or individual level, including both the job and person. It can also be undertaken by specific groups such as directors, deans, heads of departments, new employees and so on. These are not mutually exclusive. Approaches to needs analysis, however, differ. For our immediate purposes, we may identify the following two. I. Assessing the needs of all the staff to get a full picture of the institution. It is based upon the principle that even employees who may already be competent could be improved further and their strengths should be further strengthened. This approach usually starts with the top management and cascades through the institution. The chief executive Say, a vice-chancellor defines his her objectives and provides mission. Statements from which senior officers, both academic and non-academic, derive their objectives. They in turn communicate their objectives to their team and team objectives get defined. In the process, the training and development needs for each group and individual emerge. It might even be the other way around. 2. Identifying and investigating those areas within the institution which pose operational problems, this approach can identify training needs, which will have high priority for the institution. It can also identify areas where problems and issues do not result in training needs but may require an alternative solution or approach. This approach is usually more short-term in application and deals with current problems whilst the former is more strategic and development in character. However, identifying training needs, by exception, has the advantage of making an immediate contribution to the organizational success. Putting to use both the approaches simultaneously will prove to be beneficial to any institution organization. 1.5 Determining the Priority Once we complete identification of training needs, the next stage is to analyze the results so that we can determine the priorities. Let us see some guidelines which will be of assistance to us in the analysis. If the approach taken is the analysis of training and development needs for the total organization, then we should do the following. Times examine the organizational plan and draw out the general themes. For example, is the institution on its way to expand adding a few more faculties or develop new courses? Times identify the training which will support these themes and make a direct contribution to the success of the institution. That is, the institution could make a strategic decision to improve or focus on student service. And thus the need for student service training within the plan will appear as a high priority. Times consider if there are needs which, 
if not met, will severely inhibit the attainment of the institution's goals. For example, a particular department, say media production unit needs specific training in a technical area, which if not met, will prevent the institution from developing a new multimedia product as quickly as it had planned. If the level of needs analysis is a particular department, i.e. a team of individuals, the same process as the above should be applied relating it to their objectives. If the approach, however, is to analyze by exception, there may still be a number of needs identified and a limited amount of resources. The priorities still need to be defined. If this is so, we should ask the question, which need when satisfied will make the greatest contribution to the organization? The analysis of training needs and the determination of their priority are vitally important to decide the value of the training to the institution and the data on which the training plan will be based. We should note that not all needs are training needs and sometimes the underperformance of a particular unit can be caused by the organizational structure or methods of work. It is necessary to thoroughly investigate perceived training needs to ensure that the actual needs they are correctly identified. The consequences of wrongly identified needs are a waste of money, time and effort on everyone's behalf and frustration because the training may not meet the need nor make a contribution to the immediate and long-term success of the institution. In essence, needs analysis should provide information regarding times whether or not training is appropriate, times what kind of training is favored, for whom and by whom. Times what other supporting interventions, like job aids, training of officers, expert systems, workstations redesign, or incentives, will solve the problem, introduce the new system, or respond to the mandate. Time strategies for involving other related professionals in the effort. Times the content of courses, if training is judged appropriate, and Times how training and other interventions will be received by training. Providers, customers and others. 1.6 Developing Awareness of Needs In many training situations the major challenge, or at least the first, is to develop in participants the awareness of a need. This is essential primarily because most often we conduct training programs as a routine and participants are simply told to attend. Occasionally, even such programs prove to be a pleasant relief from the usual work routine. In many instances, however, participants see training events as an imposition, a waste of time, or even insulting. This leads them to feel apathetic, resistant, or hostile. Obviously, training contexts become tense. If we learned from earlier diagnostic work that a genuine need for training does exist, the initial phase of training must be concerned with overcoming participants' resistance. Further, to sustain the interest of the participants, what is important is to focus the training on their needs, present and future. People generally welcome training when they believe that the outcomes of the training would help improve their efficiency. In other words, people resist training when I, they cannot imagine how they could be more effective or satisfied in their work. 2. They do not believe their work could or should be done any differently than they are doing it now. 3. They believe others are more responsible than they are for how they Work turns out. 4. They do not believe in their own ability to operate differently than they have been. These characteristics often apply to people who have slipped into bad habits. Routine over long periods of time in a job. They occur most commonly among people whose behavior pattern is not counterbalanced by sufficient 
challenges or stimulation to maintain an open approach to their work. 1.6.1 Identifying the job needs They may have come to identify the job and themselves with how they have. Been handling it and their identities as a workforce are defined by what it does. In such instances, to acknowledge a need for change could be threatening. It would seem to imply that they have been doing something wrong all their years on the job or that they themselves are inadequate. Some would even see learning new skills as assuming total responsibility for what occurs on the job. Some others may resent the assumption that an outsider, i.e. trainer, knows something about their jobs that they themselves do not. More importantly, the general lack of faith in training, what is learnt in laboratory conditions, may not be applicable to their field situations, would make some feel apprehensive about it. And this might be a strong cause for their resistance. Dealing with adults has yet another dimension too. Most of them may not have been in a training situation for a long time or a few of them may have done badly in their studies. If people have come from these situations, they may question their ability to do well in training. Context and fear imminent embarrassment or failure. If any one or a combination of these situations seem to exist, they must be taken into account if the trainees are to look at the training experience positively and optimistically. Our role as trainers is to facilitate the trainees to envision that things can be better on their job than they are now, that changes in their own behavior can lead to improvement and that through the training experience they can be enabled to do what is necessary to move towards realizing that vision. This phase of training calls for methods that shift trainees' view from a close to an open orientation. 1.6.2 Skills needed to create awareness What skills are emphasized in developing awareness of need? A sense of need exists when people see a discrepancy between what could or should be happening in their work and what they currently are able to do. They believe in their own ability to bridge that gap and also in the capacity of the training program to help them accomplish this goal. Those who come under this category have the qualities of self-awareness, self-confidence, and knowledge of what is possible in their work roles. When qualities such as these are lacking, we as trainers must be able to develop them. Of course, it is easier said than done. For one, qualities such as these cannot easily be imparted, as they are essentially attributes which have to come from within. However, bringing an attitudinal change is essential because trainees look differently at training contexts which can be categorized into their perception of the trainer, self and training per se. The above-mentioned points would make a lot of sense if you compare the roles and functions of academic and support staff of a distance teaching university with their counterparts at a face-to-face -face university. 1.6.3 Perceiving the trainer Trainees who doubt the value of learning new things see the trainer as irrelevant or intrusive. They do not see him her as being on their side, no. Able to see their positions as they do. This being the usual situation, the trainer's task is to work towards understanding the viewpoints of the trainees and communicating the awareness to them. This role of a trainer in such situations is of paramount importance. With proper guidance, the trainees articulate their needs putting into words the moments at which they themselves are likely to feel less productive or satisfied with their work than they would like to be. Once this is established, the trainer's task will indicate how the intended experience can relate to those needs and how it helps the trainees act more effectively in their work situations. A word of caution 
we should be very careful while presenting this message. It should not diminish the trainee's dignity or the quality of their previous efforts. The trainer is someone who is a specialist, someone who has invested greater attention or done something innovative in a particular aspect of his her field, work life, and who is sharing the fruits of that endeavor with the group. The trainer's confidence must be based on his her own expertise or sense of self-worth and not on a demeaning comparison of his her own abilities with those of the trainees. For example, a distance education expert imparting training to academics on the preparation of self-learning materials may be an expert in instructional design, but the trainee academics would be experts in their own fields. Here the specialist trainer should not imagine or create an impression that she he is superior to others who have come to attend the training program. Some elements that enhance the credibility of trainers are 1. Expertness, providing evidence of the trainer's demonstrated ability or knowledge, usually when he she is introduced. 2. Trustworthiness, by being honest and frank in presenting oneself to and interacting with the group and by relieving participants' concerns about being evaluated by the trainer and 3. Dynamism, indicating genuine caring and involvement through enthusiasm, effort, eye contact and careful preparation will encourage participants to attend receptively to the trainer's message. 1.6.4 Trainee Self-Perception When trainees see how a program fits into their lives and see some benefits and success for themselves emerging from it, they are most likely to value and invest in it. Sometimes, these possible outcomes are clear to them. Sometimes we must clarify them as part of the training program itself. We can motivate the trainees extrinsically by highlighting the rewards. Training can bring and intrinsically by encouraging them to identify values within themselves which they can satisfy through the training. To further the discussion, extrinsic motivation grows as the outcomes of training become clear and appealing to participants. We can enhance this process by specifying the training objectives as concretely as possible and by doing so in ways that relate to how the trainees can make immediate use of them. Intrinsic motivation grows as trainees see that improvement in their performance will meet their personal needs better than before. 1.6.5 Training The way we plan and execute training programs affects the involvement of the trainees. Learner Controlled Instruction, LCI, is immensely helpful in making a training program effective. This is based on the premise that learning has a quality of personal involvement and it is self-initiated. LCI approaches the learner with a clear statement of objectives to be achieved and explanation or sample of the evaluation that will be used to demonstrate satisfactory achievement of the objectives, a list of the resources, materials, activities, and people available to help the learner master the objectives. This list may be referred to as a learning map since it describes useful stopovers on the route form the trainee's position at the start to his her. Ultimate goal. Once the basic parameters of the training are established, we should provide the learners with opportunities to make decisions regarding several aspects of the training. This should include time spacing. Some learn slowly than, but ultimately, can do just as well as others. Time sequencing, when particulars are allowed to determine where to begin their work and how to proceed, they often can make more individually appropriate decisions than can a trainer who is unfamiliar with their backgrounds and interests. Times problematizing, training inputs should contain the trainee's own problem situations. When they are asked to report on what they found, 
to be worthwhile in self-selected reading when they suggest topics for group discussion, etc., they would see training as directly relevant to their needs. Obviously, a trainer in this situation takes the role of a facilitator. He, she, mediates between the learner and the resources available, which can include printed materials, audio-video aids, case studies, field trips, and so on, rather than acting as a mere mouthpiece for the content of the program. However, learner-controlled instruction need not be the sole method of instruction. It can be integrated with other appropriate approaches. Nonetheless, LCI methods involve trainees in making decisions that procedure more relevant, memorable, and motivating learning experiences. 1.7 Formulation of Objectives A systematically designed training program must determine learning objectives in consonance with the objectives of the organization institution, trainee categories, and trainer types. These objectives usually refer to qualitative statements describing expected modification of competence and behavior in a trainee after having undergone a training module. This modification does not occur either in isolation or by chance or arbitrarily, as is mostly supposed in many training contexts. A systematic approach to training warrants meticulous planning at every stage. Training objectives serve as a standard specification of an output to which the trained behaviors must conform ensuring the quality of the product after training. This is of strategic importance not only because it defines and controls quality of products, but also because it substantially influences all the subsequent stages of the training system. A statement of objectives serves as an end towards which we should direct our entire training activity. In fact, we develop statements of objectives on the basis of each identified training need. Since mostly, more often than not, we carry out training need analysis in terms of knowledge, skills and attitude, training objectives also tend to fall into these categories. We shall look at a few of them here. 1.7.1 Cognitive Objectives Knowledge component of training is more educational in nature and develops the perception and understanding of the trainees. Cognitive Objectives provide the trainees with the required knowledge understanding of subjects, situations, procedures, etc., which are considered necessary to perform a task job. But they interpret and apply this understanding in their own way to specific situations. The implication is that cognitive objectives are less amenable to behavioral expressions and the behavioral outcomes are unpredictable. Knowledge inputs to achieve cognitive objectives are of complex nature. Since knowledge inputs like theories, principles, etc. are derived from different sources, they may reflect ambiguity and divergence of opinions which are more common especially in the field of social sciences. Creating the problem of uneven understanding which adversely affects but conceptual and theoretical knowledge certainly broadens the outlook and mental horizon of the trainees and stimulates their analytical, critical, and comprehending faculties. These materials also indirectly but favorably influence the skill improvement process as well as develop for positive attitude. Thus, despite certain limitations, cognitive objectives serve useful. Purposes in differing degrees. For example, they are highly unstructured and require more of knowledge inputs of diverse fields like conceptual, behavioral, technical, analytical, and communication than those of skills. 1.7 Point to Conative, Skill, Objectives. The concern of conative objective is with the formation of improvement of know how, art of doing things, or methods of job performance. Since skills 
are specific to a particular job, course editing, for example, it is essential to decide training objectives with reference to skills in behavioral terms which can be called cognitive objectives. The following are characteristics features of this type of objectives. Times job-centered, a cognitive objective specifies the work behavior required of the trainee at the end of his/her training. Times predictable, unlike cognitive objectives, cognitive ones are easily predictable. They are not subject to individual interpretation and application in one's own way because they do not basically provide to the trainee the what of the job but the how part. Thus, we can predict the behavioral outcomes. Times customized, cognitive objectives can be tailor made to suit time and learning requirements of the trainees and their organization. 1.7.3 Effective Objectives In learning processes, attitudes of the trainees play a crucial role. Positive Attitude is a prerequisite for learning knowledge and skills. As you may be aware, attitude is a subjective aspect and is formed in an individual on the basis of his her knowledge, experience and relationships with other people. Although it is complex phenomenon, a first step any training program should be towards helping the trainees develop positive attitudes. R. Discussion so far clearly reveals that we cannot decide training objectives in isolation, nor can they be imposed from top without the knowledge of the training requirements of the trainee clientele. We should therefore decide on the objectives through the collaborative efforts of the organization and the trainee groups. 1.7.4 Specific and Overall Training Objectives Organizational analysis, job-oriented analysis, and individual analysis reflect the teamwork resulting in training specifications. These training Specifications are generally skill-oriented rather than knowledge-oriented because of the emphasis given to skill component in a training system. This demands that we have to determine objectives on the basis of the training. Specifications One can visualize two types of training objectives in this context, specific training objectives and overall training objectives. The former may be defined as a statement of ideal or standard specification of performance in line with each training specifications for which a trainee gets trained. Thus, there will be a series of specific learning objectives depending on the number of items under training specifications. Each of these objectives acts as a criterion behavior in the learning process of the trainee guiding the trainer to use it to facilitate learning. After the learning experience, trainees must be able to demonstrate standard performance as per specific learning objectives and any differences will indicate deficiencies in the training. As the name suggests, these objectives should be specific, concrete, tangible and measurable facilitating time-bound result. Writing of specific learning objectives denoting expected behavior modification in respect of each skill or task gives an exhaustive list of signposts that guide the trainer. We can treat overall learning objectives as key objectives which intend to guide the overall results a training program has to achieve. We may regard the Overall learning objectives as statements of major commitments, critical performance and overall outcome to be achieved fulfilled by synchronizing specific learning objectives. Thus, they constitute expected results of training in its entirely as against the specific objectives which focus on the outcomes of the various components of a training program and their interdependence. As we are aware, training objectives may denote two aspects, quantity and quality. As the term means, a quantitative objective concerns with the 
Number of persons to be trained during a particular period of time at a particular cost. In contrast to this, a qualitative objective is associated with the standard of competence to which the trainee will be trained. We should note here that training is an expensive proposition which, therefore, must strike a judicious balance between quantity and quality. Both aspects are important for a training program and they are not mutually exclusive. You can easily relate the foregoing analysis of training objectives to training. Situations in distance teaching institutions. You can formulate objectives of the above types when you design training programs for course writers, tutors, counselors, support staff, administrators, and the regular academic staff themselves. Depending on the priorities of training, you could set the objective specific to each category of staff, each situation, and each task to be mastered or each behavioral change to be effected. Besides systematic planning and careful execution of a training program, the importance given to it by the institution of the trainees too will determine how best the objectives are achieved. A well-planned and systematically conducted training can also fail to achieve its objectives if the trainees treat the training program as a pleasure trip or their institution treats it as a mere ritual, devoid of any serious purpose. 1.8 Summary Before one actually gets down to the business of training, one should be very clear about what exactly the trainees need in order that they function better in their workplaces once the training is over. In essence, training needs Analysis is of paramount importance in the training design process. And this exactly is the focus of the unit. In this context, we have discussed the rationale for and the processes involved in carrying out training needs. Analysis This unit, as a consequence, presents various sources and tools for identifying needs. Prioritizing the needs and designing a training program accordingly are also important. We have also focused on creating awareness of needs in training contexts and translating these needs into training. Objectives All these are essential for ensuring the effectiveness of training. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel for more updates and we will see you with the next chapter.